Russeteer, which I'm hopefully pronouncing right, and if not, get used to it, is an interesting indie twist on JRPG tropes. Shining the light on the unsung heroes of the genre, you play as the owner of an item shop, providing equipment and items to the adventurers and customers who frequent your establishment. While the entire meat of the game can basically boil down to menu navigation and its dungeon exploring action RPG mechanics being 100% optional, it ties everything together with a charming character driven story if you decide to take the time to look at it. Reseteer has been around for quite a while, dating back to 2007 in Japan and making an English appearance much later on in 2010. It's established itself as a classic Japanese indie game gem and is worthy of its praise. But that's not all you want to hear, is it? From this point on, a lot of this experience will be spoiled for you. And while there's no real earth-rending plot twists or anything, a lot of this game just works well on being experienced. Otherwise, let's set up shop and work off some of this debt, shall we? This Reseteer review comes to us now thanks to the generous backing and request of Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, who requested this title most favorably among a few others. Funny enough, a friend of mine had been suggesting that I play this game for over half a decade now, so I figured the timing was as right as it could possibly be. Otherwise, I've definitely heard of this game, but I never really bothered to look at it further until now. Its origins, specifically the story of its localization, is rather impressive, and definitely shows the level of passion that one can find among indie titles, as the game, with the original creator's backing, was translated by two people who met via the Something Awful forums, and calling themselves Carpe Fulgur. Even with some of the liberties that they took with the Japanese script, like altering Reset's obnoxious Naruto-level verbal tick of shouting Yata to punctuate her sentences, instead having her make up random words by combining them with Ye, the game performed much better than they expected it to once it was finished, with a surprisingly high demo to purchase rate. Hell, that was a fun skimming of the Wikipedia article! Now I'll just go on to my thoughts and quit pretending this show was ever about giving out history lessons. Reseteer has a pretty interesting art style, reminding me of PlayStation-era JRPGs, where the sprites are usually drawn chibi-style, has some odd choppy 3D-rendered animated models for enemies, and textured polygon environments. There's also plenty of recolors, as expected from the RPG genre, but there is plenty more enemy variety than you'd expect. The style all seems like something that wouldn't mesh together, but it brings back a lot of fond memories of the time that this was a fairly normal look for these games. Of course, the game has tons of artwork for conversations that fit the very out-of-context running gag I had in MMO Grinder. You know, SUPER kawaii. Artwork only changes expressions or positions with a quick cut to fit whatever's being spoken on screen, typical of the style of a visual novel. Musically, it's one of the most upbeat games I've heard. Even the boss music gets more down to business and is peppy by proxy despite its darker tones. The shop theme is almost saccharinely peppy, and you'll be hearing it quite a lot but it all fits the tone, and I find myself getting into it after a while. The sound work holds together all right, with plenty of fitting sounds to go with the actions, especially in the dungeons, where blades will clang against walls, give solid impacts, explosions of bombs and traps will end up shaking the screen, and Reset and your adventurer of choice will punctuate the action in their native tongue. Even story scenes get small snippets of Japanese dialogue, and there's a completely sung in Japanese version of the theme song that you'll hear if you let the title screen idle or the credits roll. It's all very well acted, as far as I can tell, but there isn't exactly that many of them. Take a drink every time you hear Daijobu or Ganbate and you'll be dead by floor 3. Though I've occasionally found Tyr's voice tends to overwrite itself when skipping through its dialogue, and advancing the text is kind of this loud thwap of paper being flipped, like you're being slapped in the face with a stack of leaflets. Otherwise, pretty sound work all around. Naturally, being a game about a girl running an item shop, you do a lot of... running an item shop. You can display the items you've acquired on counters, take customer orders, requests for specific items, and purchase items from customers to flip for a higher profit. You're a set lemongrass, and this is your pawn shop. Well, it's your dad's. It's his house, at least. He left off to go adventuring and decided to saddle you with the massive debt that he'd acquired. So if you don't make that profit, you'll be out on the street and have to start the game over again. The best way to do so is to find out how much to charge each customer by choosing an appropriate markup level. Tier claims that 130% is the average, but that's a pretty high estimate. It's probably better to shoot for 120, and it'll completely depend on the customer. 
but once you get into the flow and figure it out, you'll rake in the cash and the combos. There are plenty of NPCs that you'll meet in your economic endeavor, but the four generic types and their many clones consist of the man, the woman, the little girl, and the old man. The man will usually accept prices near 130%, the woman 120, the old man 125, and the little girl 110. This can fluctuate greatly between characters for a while, depending on events and the time of the day. For example, the woman is far more stingy at night when it comes to shopping, while the old man seems to hate getting up in the morning. The key is to understand who's willing to buy at what price, while still gaining a profit, and keeping a combo of successful sales to rapidly raise your merchant level faster. Keeping up this combo, you can knock out a few levels in a day. If at any time a customer refuses a price, even if they purchase after a haggle session, that combo meter is broken and you'll have to start it all over. There is a lot more to it involving town events, the shop decor, personal relationship to the customer, but any wiki or ultra fan of this game will have you covered. This is a review and opinion show, not MMO Grinder, so I don't have time to explain all of this crap. But sadly, the game doesn't do too well in explaining it either. So take a lot of that fan advice to heart. It'll help immensely. Not that this aside is gonna curb any of those you forgot types. As you gain more levels for your shop, referred to as your merchant level, you'll have more options available, like being able to expand your store, change the decorations, carry more items out of dungeons, and convert tables to vending machines. Ah, yeah, there's dungeons! And the surprising thing is, dungeon crawling is 100% optional. Really! You can head into the game opening to the end credits without ever setting foot into the combat system. It's ideal for people who enjoy the story and aren't all that into combat, and you can reliably get by by just buying and selling items, while making for a very boring any percent speedrun. If you plan to enter dungeons, you need to head to the Adventurer's Guild. You'll get your starter character, Louis, without much effort, and unlock more characters through playing and completing the dungeons. Louis fills the knight or tank role with tons of health and a wide sweeping sword slash, a projectile blocking shield, and a couple of super moves in the form of a spinning slash and a projectile blade. Basically, Link. A perpetually broke, unlucky, and scarf-obsessed Link, but... Link. Later you meet Charm, a speedy thief, and the best character, Fight Me. Spellcasting arrogant boy Caillou, Archer Elf TL, and the directionally challenged Lancer Nagi. You can acquire these adventurers for use in dungeons once you've obtained their business card, which is usually given to you after they've become loyal customers. There's a few more to discover as well, some through specific event unlocks, or progress throughout the dungeons, which also require their own unlock mechanics. Each character has their own stats, moves, special moves, and equipment sets, and offer a variety in playstyle that the dungeon's basic fight through five floors to a boss, then leave or continue mechanics sorely lack. Each dungeon contains layouts that operate the exact same way, regardless of environment. Since dungeons are also a means to getting loot to sell for essentially free, there is a massive limit on just how many things you can carry out of these dungeons and how often you go delving. You start with 20 slots and don't really gain a lot more as you continue, and you'll be playing item triage as you head in deeper. There also seems to be a mechanic in that you can earn better items if you continue on, rather than just how deep you start. For example, you'll see better items on floor 15 if you start from floor 1 and continue past the exit three times, rather than simply starting on floor 15. Since your adventurers are using you as their equipment dealers, if they end up in your shop, they can purchase upgrades for themselves as well. However, you can't completely rely on them doing that, so you can use one of your inventory slots to bring gear for them, if they're stubbornly insistent on going into late game dungeons wielding a wooden stick and a ragged bathrobe. My least favorite, and still entirely too possible scenario, is when a character goes in buying up equipment that they can't use, or worse yet, equipment that's worse than the one that they currently have. Why are you trying to buy a sword, Charm? You can't use swords! No, PUT IT BACK! I'd have been a lot less harsh to her if she didn't buy and equip the second worst dagger in the game after she had bought a pretty damn good one. Luckily, if you're in endless mode and don't care about your combo or aren't strapped for debt cash, you can tell your newfound friends to get financially bent by charging them a ridiculous amount so that they'll storm out. Feels bad, man, but not as bad as wailing on a level 30 boss with a rusty knife. Speaking of, bosses have some pretty interesting mechanics. They're almost puzzles in some cases, and not all just giant version of small thing you already fought. The big slime needs to slowly shrink and not allow to be merged with a small slime before you can effectively damage it. The crowbar-wielding mouse needs to eat a poison mushroom in order to become vulnerable, so it's best to clear out the healthy mushrooms as they spawn in. 
A giant rock crab can't be damaged until you knock the explosive enemies into him, flipping him over on his back and attacking its weak point for massive damage. Though some of the bosses do just boil down to wailing on them quick enough to outdamage them, especially with some of the tougher fights against your potential future party members. All in all, the game boils down to managing your time by keeping the shop open, going out to pick up supplies, visiting areas for story elements, or dungeon grinding for supplies. Since you can't just do everything in one day, the game divides time into morning, noon, evening, and night, with opening the store costing one block, leaving the store to shop or visiting places in town for another block, and dungeon running taking up two. This is one of those games that's almost insidiously designed to make me want to keep playing it. You finish a day, and the next one immediately starts right up. Suddenly I find myself having to restock all my shelves, desperately wanting to trudge through the next five floors, or save up enough cash to the next bill, and then boom, it's 5 a.m., and I hate myself even more. You have no idea how glad I am I'm technically finished with this. The game does essentially end once your debt is paid, with simple installments for the first two weeks, and atrocious installments during the final two. Keep it selling, and you'll make it in no time, and a lot easier than you would expect to. It's almost like this isn't really the point of the game. I think the characters are likely the biggest draw, with the main character Reset stealing the show with her blissfully ignorant and cheerful personality, happily smiling in the face of characters that act grim toward her, and being so overly enthusiastic about her forced upon business that she'll willfully invite over a thief who just tried to rob her. You expect a character like this to get annoying, but something about the translation keeps things in check and fun to listen to. I can't really get mad at anyone who utters the phrase stained glass yayness with complete sincerity. You'll likely endear yourself to the luckless and broke Louis, the almost always drunken Charm, and even antagonistic characters like snobbish Alouette and scam artist Yuria, even if the latter character generates the most salt among the rest of your fanbase as she tries to pawn off her overpriced combo-shattering garbage. If you want even more story from any number of NPCs, it's wise to leave the shop every day and look to see if any area names are glowing. Go there and get some story events to unlock. If nothing's glowing, you can head right back to the shop immediately, and you won't even lose a time block. So it's not a bad idea to head out and check every time period, even if you don't need to head out for anything during that time. With your final debt installment of 500,000 paid, you'll get the credits, and the game officially is over. Well, at least the reason for the story. Since Reset is a bit airheaded, Tyr realizes she cannot keep records to save her life, and offers to stay with her to assist the shop. With no debt, you're free to do as you please, which very likely will mean that you're trying to tackle all the dungeons and recruit all the adventurers that you can. Doing this also grants you things like New Game Plus, keeping a lot of the things and the levels that you had at the end of your completed save, but starting the debt fresh. If you like being stressed out, there's also Survival Mode, where debt compounds every week and cannot be paid off ever, designed for high-score bragging rights. Both modes offer up instant access to any adventurer who gave you their true card, usually the adventurer that you favored most while playing. So I ended up with Charm's true card once the credits were over. It's also apparently possible to get Louie's true card at the end of the game, and seeing as how the minute you set foot in the Adventurer's Guild, you start with Louie, achieving this card is what we would refer to in the medical industry as fucking pointless. In fact, Endless Mode does seem most suited and geared for completing the dungeons. There are even characters and dungeons that will not unlock unless you've entered Endless Mode. Dungeons increase floors exponentially, with the Obsidian Tower requiring 50 floors to complete, and the next, Lapis Tower, 100 floors, concluding with the 30-floor boss rush of Crystal Nightmare. And, frankly, I don't have time for that right now. Don't get me wrong, though, I'm going to keep playing this, and I look forward to seeing more of the dungeons. But I think that you'll know exactly if you want to play this by the time your first debt payment rolls around. And with that, I'll say the obvious. Reseteer earns an easy go rating from me. It's an indie classic for a reason, and does things from a perspective that no other JRPG seemed willing to do, helping it stand out from the greats that it's been inspired by. It might not be all that complex, but there is far more depth here than it lets on, and there's plenty of challenge and ways to approach it that give it that perfect indie charm. Once again, thanks for taking the stop today, and I hope to see you on the next one. So do we have any Reseteer fans in the audience? Well, if my short stream was any indication, I'll assume so. Did you prefer to shopkeep or dungeon grind? Did you have more or less fun with Endless Mode? Are there any favorite characters that I glossed over? Spill it all out in the comments. Come watch me live at twitch.tv slash chaosd1 if you're not doing so already, and if you've not yet had your fill of moe, attend my JRPG-focused Weeaboo Wednesday streams. You can also watch me cook during some evenings with my shitty laptop mic and camera, or just get frustrated by my complete lack of coherent schedule. 
You can even watch Indie Stop debut on there live on the appropriate Friday at noon Eastern, right before it goes officially live on YouTube. Remember, I am more than willing to hear suggestions for indie games that you want to see covered on the show. I have no shortage of potential titles to look at, but I am always up for new stuff and suggestions. If you want to force my hand and hip-check your way into the queue, I have my Patreon that you can choose to support the show at, with tiers specific to Indie Stop and MMO Grinder, like early access to Indie Stop episodes before they go up in the Friday time slot, giving direct suggestions to me to more or less force your way into the queue, or to have me make a pained attempt to pronounce your name in the credits. So this episode, I'd like to give a verbal thank you to my raid leader and higher supporters, Nate McPherson, Arthur D. Gonzalez-Martin, Neander, Kaisme, Sonic Rose, and A. Smith. Thank you for watching and supporting, and I'll see you in the next video.